program chairman, uh, Cindy Crump. So Cindy, if you'll take it from here. All right, good evening, everybody. Can you hear me? Tonight we have David Owens, and um, David is the assistant superintendent at Lake Mineral Wells State Park and Trailway. David's been with state parks for 35 years, and for 20 of those years, he's been at Lake Mineral Wells State Park. And he manages the park administration, the interpretive programs, and the educational programs. And I just want you to know that he's also on YouTube. So if you want to look him up there, he's, he's pretty good there too. Um, tonight's program is he's going to be sharing with us an overview of the park. He's going to be talking about the, park volu the park's volunteer program and some opportunities that are available for volunteering. And he's going to present something about plants called the good, the bad, and the unusual. So David, it's your turn. Thanks very much for coming out tonight. Thank you for having me out. Um, uh, I would uh, much be more comfortable with sitting in front of people, believe it or not, that, but been talking to a screen and seeing a few faces, but that's okay. We can do this. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm uh, from Lake Mineral Wells State Park, and uh, I guess the first thing you want to know is, uh, I guess you're all seeing a picture of the lake, I hope. <laughs> uh, just a little bit about uh, what we do in state parks. Uh, one of the things that uh, we like to do is, is to preserve our nature and our history of the, of the area. And so we're right in the middle of the cross timbers of Texas. And so we represent as a state park that, that eco region, the cross timbers eco region. And so one of the, and, and the plant life that are, it's there is, is one of the things that we really uh, work hard to preserve. Uh, we have some unusual plant life, but I wanted to give you a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of a, run through, I guess, of, of what we have here at the park, which we have a, a, lake, a, a lake that's about 400 acres or so, all within the boundaries of a 3,000 acre state park. And uh, it is part of the, the Western Cross Timbers eco region. And so we, we want to protect that. We want to protect the, that so people in the future can come out to the park and see what Texas, uh, this part of Texas looks like. Uh, without the disturbance uh, of, uh, of uh, you know, people and uh, industry and things like that. So that is what we're preserving. Now, one of the things, one of our main features that we have out here is kind of hard to see unless you know something about it. And that is we have an ancient cross timbers woodland out here at the state park. And this is one of our interpretive signs that lets people know what we have. Um, we have a section of ancient cross timbers woodlands that uh, that basically means that it has been uh, virtually undisturbed uh, from the from the uh, before European settlers came here, and it is a very rare thing in the Western cross timbers to have uh, an ancient cross timbers. I don't know if you can see the map down at the bottom. It's got a part of Texas and it's got some white there um, within the green. And that is where the cross timbers are located. Now, every one of those little black dots on there is ancient cross timbers woodlands. And ours is just a little tiny little dot right there. It's not very big, but uh, we, we, we're gonna try to preserve this ancient cross timbers woodland so people can go and walk through this area on a, on a trail and they can see what this part of Texas looked like 300 years ago without the disturbances. Um, and uh, we had a, a, a dendrochronologist, uh, David Stolle from University of Arkansas come out and look at it and he made this quote, Lake Mineral Wells State Park includes the largest and most outstanding remnant of ancient cross timbers woodland still surviving on public lands. And that is what we're trying to preserve. And so among other things that we have in the park, that's one of the things that we're really, um, really trying to uh, 
make sure people are able to see uh, when they come out to the park. Um, well, we also have uh, one of uh, an outstanding natural feature called Penitentiary Hollow. Uh, and Penitentiary Hollow is uh, uh, lime, I mean, uh, sandstone rock that has uh, kind of fractured and spread apart. So these little makes these little canyons in through here. And it is uh, another outstanding feature. And because of this uh, geologic action, it has created an, its own little ecosystem down in there. And we have some plants that, uh, that are down there that uh, are not supposed to be in this part of Texas. And so it's another thing that we like to, uh, to preserve. Um, people rock climb down there and, it's, uh, and they're supposed to be able to use this area for recreation. And uh, it's kind of a balancing act, preserving the area, uh, naturally, and also letting people use the area for recreation. So we have to really do a good management job to preserve those plants that are down in there. And bird species too. There's uh, canyon wrens that are in there as well. They're not supposed to be in this part of Texas. So uh, we, we've, uh, we would try to do that the best we can. We want people to see it, but we also want to preserve it. So then another aspect of the, tr of the park is we have a, a rails to trail trailway. In other words, these were old uh, railroad corridor that went from Weatherford to Mineral Wells and it had been abandoned uh, and uh, uh, it had turned into a trailway, 20 mile trailway that goes uh, through this part of the cross timbers as well. And so we are we maintain the trail, and it is part of the park. And uh, uh, people can walk up and down, ride horses and bicycles up and down the, the trailway. And and uh, we are trying to uh, make sure that that is um, preserved uh, for the different areas of, of uh, different types of terrain and different types of habitat that we have along that trail. It changes, uh, you know, over a twenty mile. Period. So, uh, so that's, that's another aspect that we're trying to preserve. Um, this is uh, one of the projects that um, we're, we're uh, I would say, very successful with. This is a pollinator garden in front of our administration building. I can look out the window right now and see it. <laughs> but uh, uh, Cindy and her crew have really uh, done well because this is volunteer. Uh, this is a volunteer uh, managed uh, garden, and uh, we do very little to it, but the volunteers sure help out and sure get this one going. I would say that that's their garden. Uh, so some of you may have worked on it before, and we really appreciate it. So um, let's see. How about some, let's talk about some volunteer programs, volunteer uh, things that you can do or you can be involved in at the state park. Um, this garden is one. Uh, we also have an area where we have uh, wildlife viewing blinds and we have uh, bird viewing blinds and those are all volunteer maintained as well. And so uh, those are some opportunities that, that you have for volunteering. Uh, of course, we have volunteers that help help our uh, maintenance crew do uh, do work that way in that way, and, and they kind of do projects for us. So uh, most of our volunteers that come out, we don't make them clean the bathrooms. You know, we will put them on projects that they can they'll enjoy and and can benefit the park as well as benefit themselves. Um, so so they uh, they do they do some projects that maybe we. Um, is kind of low on our priority list to keep the park operational. So uh, that's some opportunities that you have. Another opportunity for volunteer is something I've been trying to get going and it's been uh, somewhat successful. And then of course COVID hit and, and uh, winters come along, but uh, we have a, I would like to have uh, volunteer led nature hikes for the, uh, the people that come out here on the weekends. 
Uh, and uh, it would be great to be able to have somebody to have someone or a few people to lead those hikes on Saturday mornings and, uh, and introduce these people and, and help them to learn about the Cross Timbers and, and uh, Penitentiary Hollow. And, uh, and I think it'd be uh, really enjoyable. It's something that I would like to do, but I'm also doing uh, other educational interpretive programs um, uh, at that night. And so it'd just be an added benefit. And we've had some success with some, some volunteers coming in to do that, but we need to kind of get that restarted. If anybody's interested in doing that, we'll do a little training, make sure that we're sticking with our, uh, with our, uh, man, uh, with our, um, with our plan to uh, present the right information. And, and uh, uh, so just, just kind of let me know somehow, you can get a hold of me somehow if you plan on doing that. I will talk a little bit more about uh, some volunteer uh, uh, opportunities uh, throughout my presentation. So uh, now we're going to go to my presentation and tell you the truth. I give this presentation to our employees out here. Um, this is a, a presentation that we want that we do for our employees, so they will recognize plants in the park and be and appreciate them and help to preserve them. And so I call it plants, the good, the bad, and the unusual. Okay, so that gets their attention and hopefully it got your attention. <laughs> to uh, to pre present some of these plants that we have out here. And we just want them to be able to, to distinguish between the good plants we need to preserve, the bad plants, like the invasives that we need to get rid of, and the unusual plants that aren't supposed to be here in the park, but somehow are. Or maybe they are not any, they're in, in one spot in the park and nowhere else. And so we need to preserve those. And so we're gonna start out with the good and the unusual plants. These are plants we need to preserve. And so this will give you uh, some plants maybe you can come out and, and, uh, and look at and, uh, and see in this part of the country. I always start out with this one. Everybody knows that and you think, well, what in the world? Why don't, why don't we, everybody knows blue bonnets, right? Well, I want, my, I want my team out here, I want the, the maintenance crew and all the staff out here to be able to recognize this plant without flowers. Because we start mowing pretty, you know, we start mowing uh, pretty early in the spring and I don't want, I really would like to preserve these so they can flower out. And in this state park, this particular part of the Cross Timbers, for some reason, Blue bonnets are just not uh, usual. There's a very few places in the park where we have blue bonnets. And so it is one of those plants where in other parts of the state, they're abundant, you can't miss them. But here in the park, just not very usual. And so um, we wanna make sure that people know that we do have a few, but not very many. Uh, and so of course, here's the, Here's the blue bonnets bloomed out. And uh, we always like to let you know where they are because they're, they're not just everywhere in the park. We put a little map up here. So this is a map of the park with the lake in the middle. And uh, these blue bonnets are only located as far as I can tell, right here in this square up here at the entrance of the park. So uh, that's about the only place in the park that we have them. So we want, we want you to know where they are. And so if you want to come in and see them in, in, uh, or in April, uh, that's where they're located. Okay, another one that we need to preserve is standing cypress. And standing cypress, I show you this picture of it and I show our staff this picture of it is because this is a standing cypress before it has flowers. Standing cypress are biennials 
And so it takes a while for them to germinate and a couple of years for them to mature and flower. And so for that reason, you don't want to chop them down. You don't want to dig them up. You don't want to mow them over because that, uh, that will, uh, will be a detriment to their preservation. Let's put it that way. And uh, the reason why you don't, that it's also the reason why you don't see them very often on the, on the sides of the roads and the highways because it does take two years and they mow those. And, it, and then after a while, um, you just don't have any seeds left for, for them to reproduce. And, uh, and uh, if you, you probably know what standing cypress looks like, but here is uh, standing cypress when it flowers out. And that is uh, something that we, after it gets that high, we can avoid that. Uh, when, it's, when it's short, we just want our folks to know and uh, that we need to preserve that plant. Uh, and, so, and so there's a standing cypress there. And we're doing a pretty good job of, uh, we're doing a pretty good job of preserving that. I see more and more as the year, years go on, more and more standing cypress out in the park. As a matter of fact, last year we had, uh, we, I think it was a year before last, we had a really good crop. And uh, here's one of our rangers standing beside one, and that thing is over seven feet tall. And so uh, he was kind of proud that that they had preserved it, and knew what they were, knew what they were, and uh, he wanted to get a picture of it out there and see how tall they were and show it to everyone. So, so our standing cypress are in a couple of places in the park. Uh, right now is a great time to look at them. So uh, they're out and they're blooming. And uh, we have them back here along uh, the Penitentiary Hollow area. Uh, this, is, this is where we normally see them uh, in a locally abundant there. And we also have some on the sides of this main road going to our Cross Timbers camping area. And so um, those are a couple of places where standing cypress are, are located and we're trying to preserve and they are spreading. We're, we've got them uh, all up and down this road now. Uh, so they're, they're doing really well. Another thing that is really, this is one of the unusual, okay? So this is an unusual thing for this park. We have a naturally occurring shagbark hickory down in Penitentiary Hollow. Now this is probably one of two, and this was several years ago when I took this picture. That, that uh, little sapling there is now about six feet tall. And so um, before, 19, before 2013, I'm still using 19. <laughs> before 2013, we had, a, we had a drought. We had one as tall as the cliffs, about 40 feet tall, Shagbark hickory down in, in the penitentiary hollow, um, but the, the drought got it and, uh, and killed it. So we looked around and see if they had any more coming up out there and we found two. Now, what makes these significant? They are way out of their range, okay? This, this guy is, there's probably, I don't know, 150, 200 miles out of their range of where they normally grow. And um, Bob O'Kinnon from Britt, uh, he, he goes all over Texas looking, looking at plants, looking at different kinds of things from the Botanical Re Research Institute of te Texas. Um, and he told me that this shagbark hickory right there is the westernmost naturally occurring shagbark hickory in the world. And so, uh, it's an unusual thing to have a little ecosystem of its very own down in that penitentiary hollow and certain plants that are there that shouldn't be there. And so these are the things we're trying to preserve. Um, so, there is a, so there's a shag bark hickory down in there. This is the unusual. It's not unusual for the state of Texas. They're all over East Texas, but in this part of the state, very unusual. Um, so that's located down here in Penitentiary Hollow. Like I say, it's, we're gonna have a lot of squares come up right there. 
uh, with, with the different kinds of plants that we have. Another plant we have down in the hollow is a jack in the pulpit. Jack in the pulpit is about 200 miles out of its range down there. And there's a little patch of it down there in kind of a remote spot. And we're kind of glad that it's remote down there. Um, it's uh, not visited very well, very often by people, but uh, this plant is not supposed to be in this part of Texas. Uh, it's pretty common uh, in the eastern part of the United States and East Texas, but not here. And so this is uh, another one we have to, we need to protect and we need to make sure that it, that it keeps going. And uh, we're doing the best we can. It's, it's, um, it's, uh, it's doing really well. And so now this is the flower and the flower is very unique but the, the, it doesn't put on a flower very often. Some years it doesn't put on a flower at all. So I always like to show you what it looks like uh, without the flower. And this is what we usually see right here. Three leaves uh, coming out of the top of a, of a stem. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we tell people to stay away from the three-leaved plants because it's poison ivy. Well, this isn't poison ivy, but we still want them to stay away, you know? <laughs> Let that grow. So uh, here's Jack in the pulpit that's down in Penitentiary Hollow down there. Very unusual plant for this part of Texas, and we are trying our best to preserve it. Um, another plant that's uh, unusual to the park, only in one little spot in the park, and that's go through. And uh, uh, it may be common in other places, but in this park, there's only one spot. And guess where it is? Penitentiary Hollow. That's right. So go through is, is in one little isolated spot, and we go check it every year, make sure that it's blooming out and doing its thing. And, and uh, it's another unusual plant for the park. may not be unusual for the state, but, but it is for the park. And so uh, we want we want to make sure everyone knows about it and and is and can and protecting it. Um, it is located again down here in Penitentiary Hollow. Okay, another thing that we have down there that um, is kind of unusual. This uh, we have all kinds of ferns, and there's about ten species of ferns down there in in the hollow. Uh, some of them are, are usual for this area, but there are a few uh, that really aren't supposed to be here. And um, my old plant taxonomy professor, Dr. Jack Stanford, uh, came out a couple of years ago and he just wanted to go down there because he had heard that there was a fern species down there that wasn't supposed to be here and he wanted to see it for himself. And we took a little trip down there and, uh, and he found it. And uh, he was, he was kind of surprised. And, and I said, yeah, we have all kinds of things down here in our little ecosystem down here. So ferns is another thing that, that we need to uh, preserve. Uh, we have so many different species. I can't pick out the exact ones, but, but uh, we have lots of ferns growing in the rocks down there. I think, uh, let's see. Another one that's kind of unusual for the park uh, is Eve's necklace. We only have a few examples of that in the park, and I wanted to make sure that our employees knew that this is something we need to preserve. So uh, this may be common in other places, but in the park, it's it, it's uh, not very it's not very common. Only a couple of places I've seen it, and I wanted to make sure that they understood that uh, you don't need to when you're doing trimming around, you don't need to trim this one, you know? So uh, wanted to make sure it was recognizable. Um, of course, it puts out the little uh, legumes out there, the little, the little uh, beans out there that look like a necklace, look like pearls that are green uh, hanging down there. And that's why they call it Eve's necklace. So I have a few examples of that. Let's uh, see, they are down in the hollow, of course. And we also have some on the side of the road over here next to our, uh, our shelter area. And so 
Uh, if you wanted to come out and see that particular plant, those are the locations uh, of where, the, where you can find them. Uh, let's see, another one that's really, really unusual for our area is uh, Quail's Ragwort. And y'all may know Jeff Quail. Um, he discovered this uh, probably 15, 20 years ago on our trailway. And so on our trailway, um, he discovered this plant and uh, did the research and named it Quail's Ragweed. So it's a new species uh, of Senecio. Uh, that was located on our park. And so we do our best to recognize that. Uh, people come out uh, every spring and look for it and see if we can find it in, in other places uh, in the park and on the trailway, that 20 mile trailway. So another plant that's very unusual. Um, butterfly weed is unusual for the park, okay? It may be growing everywhere but we only have a couple of places on the park where we have this. We sure don't want to mow this down. We want to preserve this. And so I want to make, make sure that people, that our, our, our people know what it is, where it is, and uh, we need to preserve it. That is, that is a, a, a beautiful flower to, for visitors to see. And so uh, butterfly weed, the part of the milkweed family, uh, the one of the only milkweeds that uh, doesn't exude that, that milky latex when, you when a leaf comes off. It's, it's, it's a milkweed, but it doesn't have milk. So anyway, we want to preserve that as well. Um, and we have it located down here uh, close to Penitentiary Hollow, and then on the road to across Timbers is the only two places in the whole park I've ever seen it. And so, uh, and so uh, that if you wanted to come out and find it, and that, that's time, this is the time to do it. And uh, those are the two places. Another one that's not, not that uncommon everywhere else, but just in this, in this park, there's only one place I've ever seen um, this penstemon. It's a foxglove, uh, uh, but this, this penstemon I've only found in one spot. And uh, you can see there are several of them right there in that one little area, but it is a small little area. And so we wanted to make sure everybody recognized that. Um, I saw it last, I saw it last spring. And then previous to that, I didn't see it for about three years. So I uh, hadn't seen it this year. So hopefully it will continue to, uh, will come out uh, in the future in this one little spot. So. So we're, we're trying to protect that plant as well. Even though it may be common everywhere else inside the park, just not very common. Uh, it is located in a really populated spot. It's right between two camping areas. And so right there is the only place I've ever seen it. And that little area is rich in, in different kinds of wildflowers and unusual ones for the park. So we're, we're doing our best to make people stay on the trail and, and not ride the bicycles over it and things like that um, right in our camping area. Another one is a narrow leaf coneflower and uh, it is kind of in the same area and not very, it's not very widespread in the park. And so we want to make sure we um, we preserve that. Uh, so this is uh, this is echinacea. Most people, this is one of the rare ones where people recognize this plant by its scientific name over its its uh, common name. Uh, a lot of people use echinacea uh, as a supplement for health reasons, and so this is uh, this is one of them we have growing wild in the park, and. Uh, Guess what? It's in that same area. Right there is where we've found this. Uh, it, right in the camping areas. And so we're trying to, we're doing our best to preserve that. And um, uh, even though it's really nice to do, uh, we, we want to keep the, the little kids from picking them and taking them to their mother, you know? 
inside a state park trying to get that across to people. Even though it's nice to pick to give flowers to your mother, uh, this one's not, we shouldn't pick them in a state park. So uh, right there in that populated area, we're doing our best to preserve them. Uh, let's see, here's another one, a Lacey Germander. I, I haven't seen this, but one place in the park as well. Uh, so so this, this grows in that very same spot down there with the foxglove and the, and the uh, I don't know what it is about that particular spot, but there's just a little bit of a habitat for these, plant, these plants down there. It's another one that I wanted people to make sure that they knew about. And this makes a, a pretty low ground cover and uh, very, uh, very pretty, and very uh, kind of an unusual plant for the park. So, so, uh, so basically here we go again, right in that area between those two. Uh, other plants that are in there, we have tall scurfy pea down in there and some, uh, some uh, uh, let's see, they changed the name on me. Uh, they call it sensitive briar now, it used to be shrankia, but they, I think, I think it's mimosa I think now. But anyway, have some of that down in there. Uh, in that area and uh, some celestial is down in there. Uh, so, so we have a, a kind of an unusual little ecosystem, a little, a little habitat down there that has a, a few plants that are kind of unusual in that area. Um, and of course we have some spider warts and they're, they're normally common everywhere, but for some reason in the park, we have a place, just a few places here and there dotting the area and we just don't want those mowed down before they go, they go to seed and, and do their thing. Uh, we want people to be able to see them for as long as they're out. And so we, we make sure people see those and make sure our, our uh, staff out here knows where they are and, and what they look like. And let's preserve those. And normally I'll find those down there, of course, Penitentiary Hollow. Uh, so let's see, other plants, uh, larkspur is, uh, is one that uh, we only see in a few places. This is a little more common than, than others, but uh, we'll, see, we'll see this, um, this larkspur uh, here, there, and everywhere, but uh, not, not real common. And I just wanted our guys to know what it looked like and let's preserve that. Let's keep that going. All right, so we talked about the good plants we need to do, and here comes the bad ones. And uh, we need to know which ones are not good. We don't need to let these guys spread. And so we do have some red tip fatinias, especially along the trailway where the old railroad corridor uh, is. And uh, we have some of those. And so we need to see if we can get rid of some of those. It's one of the things that volunteers might be able to do and help us with because uh, our, pro our priorities are um, to keep the park going and to uh, keep it maintained and things like that. And that is to come in and see if we can eradicate some of these invasives that come in. And uh, if we have people that are knowledgeable about plants, they can be the people that can make sure we make sure uh, are eradicating the proper plant and leaving the good ones. And so this is a, a group like uh, a group like uh, Native Plant Society could help us out with that. Uh, but that is ones that we need to uh, we need to see if we can get rid of out here. Let's see some other plants. Uh, we have those located along that state trailway. Um, out at the park. So uh, that is our little trailhead that goes down to the trailway that goes 20 miles from Mineral Wells to Weatherford. So that's why I have it uh, marked like that. Uh, and so we can know where it is and see if we can do something about getting rid of it. Um, and privet. Oh my goodness. We got some privets that started over there. And so You'd be able to recognize that privet and know that we don't want that stuff to spread and let's see what we can do about getting rid of it. So um, this Chinese privet, 
uh, nice little or ornamental that uh, people use for bushes and it goes and it, uh, birds eat it and come along and, and plant those seeds. And so uh, we want to make sure that, uh, that we know what it is and we don't let that spread and we move it on out. Uh, you know, it's kind of ironic, uh, take you back to Cleburne State Park from where I came from. Um, Cleburne State Park is a CCC park. So we had the uh, conserva Civilian Conservation Corps come in and build the park. And unfortunately, they hadn't learned yet and around their little barracks in the park, they decided that they needed to spruce it up a little bit. And so they planted privet. Now the whole end of the park down there is covered with privet from a conservation agency. We live and we learn. <laughs> so so uh, another thing that we need to uh, get rid of. Now it's gonna be located by this old house site over here. And that's probably where it came from. Uh, over here on the corner, just across the spillway, we have some of it there. So uh, we wanted our folks to know where it was and see what we could do about getting rid of it. And Japanese honeysuckle, hard stuff to uh, control. It is all along the trailway and just about wherever there's any kind of a fence or anything. Uh, of course, Japanese honeysuckle is, is, uh, is a neat to look at. It's got two different colored flowers on it. Man, it's nice, right? Uh, until it starts taking over things and starts drowning out some of the light that gets to the ground in certain places. And so Japanese honeysuckle wanted, wanted be people to be able to, to recognize that and see what we can't do about thinning that out as much as we can. Um, Another thing that we have along the side of the lake is giant reed. And uh, I see more and more patches of it as the years go on around our lake. And, um, and so it's a really difficult one because if you use any kind of herbicide on it, it's right next to the water. And we don't wanna do any damage to anything right next to the water. You're putting this poisons out and things like that. And then our rocky shoreline with those rhizomes that they have is really, really difficult to control. And so anybody has any ideas, uh, I'm game, <laughs> I'm ready. So uh, that's another one I wanted people to recognize is this, is this uh, giant reed that um, is, well, I like to say it's in denial. Well, it should be in denial because that's where it comes from, the Nile River and that area of, of uh, Africa and Europe, uh, but uh, it's here now. And so uh, we need to kind of control that as best we can. Um, other things that are, we have for some reason, I don't know why, but we have some periwinkle uh, down in Penitentiary Hollow. And you'd say, well, just yank that stuff up, man. Get rid of it, here's the problem. We also have Jack in the pulpit that grows up in it every once in a while. And so it's, it's kind of sharing the ground and we don't want to, we don't know how to preserve the Jack in the pulpit and get rid of the periwinkle, but it's pretty isolated. So we're, it's not spreading out too much. So we're doing, doing our best to kind of control it without, um, without hurting the Jack in the pulpit that's down there. Um, so we wanted people to, we wanted our staff to know what it was and, and uh, know that uh, it's pretty much an evergreen. It's about the only thing green down in the, in the uh, penitentiary hollow uh, in, in the winter. Let's see, and of course it's down there in penitentiary hollow. Want to make sure that our folks knew where that was. And then you got the old bastard cabbage that's starting to take over. Uh, it's even gotten way up here. Uh, and so we have a few of those plants around that come up every spring and wanted, wanted our folks to know that that's okay to pull those up, get rid of them. And so uh, it's starting to encroach in onto the park and not, uh, not there yet, but we're trying to keep a handle on it. And I just wanted them to know what that looked like. Um, 
let's see other things in the park wisteria we have some of that that's growing along that old house site we don't want that to get out of control that's not supposed to be here it looks nice nice ornamental but it's in a state park it doesn't need to be here so uh, that thing is located by this old house site uh, so part of our history is some of the plants but those plants don't need to be growing right in a state park so uh we wanted to make sure that they understood that where it is and uh see if we can thin that out and make sure it doesn't get out of control and every once in a while we'll have some remnant crepe myrtles another another uh, ornamental plant growing around the house sites and things and see if we can eliminate those when we can they're not too invasive but you know hey not part of not part of the natural features of the park not part of the native plants so we want to uh, make sure they understand where it is and, and what it looks like and, and get rid of it here and i have that growing over here for some reason uh, maybe part of the city park at one time before it was a state park um and maybe some up, we have some up at a house site that's up above, just barely on park property as well, up there. All right, and then of course the dreaded King Ranch blue stem has now taken over a whole park. And, uh, and this is one that uh, just wanted the guys to know that this particular, this particular grass that they cuss because it grows so fast and they have to mow so often is one of those invasives that if we hadn't let it go, then we wouldn't have the problem we have now. Give them some incentive to say, hey, let's try to keep these invasives out of here. And, uh, and we, maybe we wouldn't have to work so hard. And so uh, not much you can do about that now. It's so widespread. I don't think there's any eradication that you can do. But just to let people know that even a little grass that was put out on a ranch for kind of help the, help the cattle grazing can get out of hand. And that's what has happened. And uh, so good old King Ranch blue stem. Some people I know are out there cringing at every one of these. All right, another one that kind of can get out of hand is jointed goat grass. This stuff is an annual, but it puts out like 28 seeds for every plant um, that comes up. And uh, I haven't seen too much of it here at the park, but it has really done some damage in the past. Wanted people to be able to recognize it so we can keep it mowed before it goes to seed. And uh, being an annual, if we can make keep it from going to seed, then we can kind of el eliminate it. Uh, tell you what, it happened at Cleburne State Park. When I was there, I think I have a picture here. Yeah, here in 1996, this is a picture in April of the blue bonnets in this field. When you go into Cleveland State Park, look at those blue bonnets everywhere, just covered. By the year 2000, the jointed goat grass had gotten in there and it comes out earlier than the, than the blue bonnets do. And it kind of choked everything out before we could get a handle on it. And so here is a picture of that same field, an overhead kind of like an aerial shot of that same field in April of 2009. That field should be covered in blue, but it is not anymore. That's the same picture as I showed you before. Uh, and so that is one, one that we need to keep an eye out on because it was definitely the jointed goat grass that eliminated and got and, and allowed all the blue bonnets at Cleveland State Park. This is what an invasive can do. And so uh, just wanted to uh, let our folks know and let you know that we're doing the best we can to uh, preserve our plant life and, they, and all of our nature out here at the park. And uh, I think that's my last one. And so I guess we can open it up to, oh yeah, and we did find a bit of it right there, but we got it under control, I think. So we watched that area as well. But I think that's it on, on the, uh, the presentation. Um, I guess uh, if you have any 
questions or anything? I guess that's what's next. Did you ever do any burning there? Yes, we have a uh, we have a really really good burn plan, and uh, that's one of the things that's helped us out a lot. Our our fire team is located here in the park for the whole entire north north Texas, located here in the park. So we uh, we definitely burn a, a, sec, a, a section, a little spot every year. And so uh, we have a really good burn plan. Uh, there, there, we have a question in the chat window. It's, um, well, the question is uh, about whether you allow uh, cultural remnants like crepe myrtle to remain around the cultural sites like the house that you mentioned or? Uh, in some, uh, in some, that some parts of the state uh, we do being a more natural park rather than a historical park, uh, we like to uh, go ahead and uh, get rid of the ones that may spread. Um, in a historical park, sometimes they let those go and they say and they control them the best they can to preserve that history. Um, so it's not the same in every park, but um, I actually have a regional. Uh, regional uh, natural natural resource specialist in our region, and we also have a cultural resource specialist. And one day I thought it would be fun to get them in a debate. And so I said, "Hey, we got these we got these cultural plants that were historically part of it. Do we keep them, or if they are not native, do we take them down?" And while they were standing there, I just kind of walked off and let them argue. <laughs> but uh, but uh, yeah, we. There are places where we do preserve those, but we try to keep them under control. Other places where we want to make sure we get rid of them. I noticed that you often said when you were looking, when you were showing us the plants, that they were they were not as common there. That there were a lot of plants that are fairly common in our area that you said were kind of uncommon there. Is that is that something that is uh, because of? Uh, how much that park is used or do you think that there are uh, ecological reasons for it? Um, uh, I think maybe part of it is uh, is the park use, but it also um, has a lot to do with soil type and things like that. Uh, we have some unusual soil types in the park that it's just uh, maybe uh, a couple of miles away, we have different kinds of soil that that like that these plants like, and in here we just uh, don't have any that uh, have that same type of soil type, except in one spot or two, and then it's there and they are there. Um, it's kind of like Penitentiary Hollow. Uh, they uh, the 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 theory is that uh, that. At one time, the climate was such that it was more like an East Texas climate this far west. And as it changed, all of those plants that couldn't take the dry and the heat uh, kind of died out and it moved to the east. Well, down in Penitentiary Hollow, it's a different, it's a different world down there. It's, it's more moist and it's shadier. And those plants that were here in the past or were able to survive down there and so and so they are still here when all the rest of them are gone how old is that park this park is uh as a state park it was opened in in 1981 and uh it's been a city park for way longer than that they they built the dam for the lake in 1920 and then the, the front part of the park where the dam is was a city park uh, owned by the city, the back half of the lake and uh, was a military base. And so it was part of Fort Walters uh, military base. One time a infantry training center and a helicopter uh, all the way up to 1975. And then it was donated to the state for a state park and the city donated their part for the state park in 75. By 1981, it was a state park. Hmm. And uh, and I, I didn't realize this before, but uh, it, I think you said that you also do, uh, that you're also over the entire trail that goes all the way between uh, 
of the park and all the way to Weatherford, doesn't it? Yes. And yeah, we maintain that that entire trail. That's under our park. Are there are there wildflowers along there at all? Yes, we have uh, we have some uh, some really good wildflowers. As a matter of fact, on one stretch of the trail, that uh, Senecio species was discovered by Jeff Quayle. So it was on the trailway uh, where that was discovered. And uh, we have a person here who's wanting to know about uh, uh, what are some good days and hours that you could like to have volunteers. Um, mainly our volunteers need to need to work uh, during the week. That's when our population, our, our visitors are, are lower. Uh, unless that is, uh, you want to volunteer for the trail and that'd be on Saturday mornings. Uh, wanted to lead a trail hike on Saturday mornings, uh, but uh, that's the best time. And uh, especially for the uh, for the uh, uh, pollinator garden, uh, Sandy Crump would be the person to talk to about about that. But she she's kind of headed up that whole thing. She kind of owns that that garden, <laughs> and so Andy. and so. Uh, uh, she's in charge. She's in charge of the volunteer group for that. We we really do appreciate it. Suzanne is asking about uh, what are those ruins of buildings that can be seen off the right side of the road uh, as you head towards Penitentiary Hollow. Uh, right side of the road buildings. Oh, okay. I see what you're talking about. Yeah, our boundary fence is right there. And I mean, it may not be 50 feet from the road. And so there's private land on the other side. And some of those are those buildings over there are houses uh, off of off of the park. Are they are they uh, abandoned houses or one, one is abandoned and there's several that you can see is abandoned. But there's there's one that is uh, really run down looking and abandoned, but there's other people living in other parts of them that you can see. Did you have a, uh, Did you have some questions, Carol? Uh, if people do want to volunteer, do they need to uh, come and talk to you, or what, yeah, what do they have to do? Okay, well, I am the volunteer coordinator out here at the park, and so uh, they would need to contact me. Um, I probably should have that uh, information up at the last slide so they can know how to get a hold of me. But if you call uh, the park or, um, or or send me an email, I can sure get that put together. What uh, a lot of our volunteer, the jobs that need to be done might need to be done not on an individual basis, but with a group. And so uh, we can get a group together then we could get a lot more more done uh, uh, that way. So it, it takes a little coordination, I guess. Oh, I was going to say there's another question that just got uh, asked in the chat box here about how much of uh, the giant cane, I think it's a Aronda Donax. Do you have a lot yeah. of that? Yeah. How much there is? Well, yeah. it's... Uh, I have seen it all the way around the shorelines of the lake now, but not thick, just spotty here, there, and everywhere. And uh, uh, it's getting more and more. I've been here 20 years, and I've seen twice as much now as I did when I started. It is a really difficult place to get to, for one thing, because our banks are so steep, and uh, it's really difficult to get to. And then our, our rules on uh, herbicides and things like that uh, next to that water is really, really um, stringent and so in a state park and so it's really hard to control. Well, David, we, uh, we thank you again. All right. Well, I appreciate you letting me, uh, letting me talk and let me pre for both park a little bit and, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to come out and, and see some of these plants that we have down in Penitentiary Hollow. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. Great presentation.